If you've been watching this channel for a while, it should come to no surprise that I'm a huge fan of the JRPG genre. And for those of you who are new here, I absolutely love JRPGs. Out of all the different video game genres out there, JRPGs are the most relaxing and well-written games out there. And sometimes you're not in the mood to throw out some smoking sick style combos in Devil May Cry 4. Sometimes you want to sit back, relax with some snacks and play Grandia 2 for the Dreamcast. Ever since I was a child, I've always had an interest in the Japanese video game industry. So I was exposed to Sugoi JRPGs at an early age. And the companies I have to thank for that are Sony and Square Enix. Well, technically they were called Squaresoft back then, because they hadn't merged with Enix yet. That happened in 2003. Now you might think that me talking about this doesn't have anything to do with the topic for today. But hear me out for a sec. When Final Fantasy VII was released in 1997 for the absolutely amazing PlayStation, it blew everyone away and made the West finally appreciate a genre they never knew existed. And that started the JRPG boom here in the West. People were now actively seeking out games similar to Final Fantasy VII. They needed more of this JRPG goodness that they've been missing out on, and companies were willing to develop and localize more of these kinds of games. Games like Valkyrie Profile, Xenogears, Parasite Eve, Breath of Fire 3, Star Ocean The Second Story, and many many more came out after the success of Final Fantasy VII. Even smaller companies wanted in on the action. Game Arts, who earlier works consist of the Lunar franchise for the Sega CD, was working on the Grandia series. But there were of course a couple of JRPGs out for the PlayStation before Final Fantasy VII hit the scene. Games like Suikoden and Persona started out on the PlayStation and were both released before Final Fantasy VII. And they were not very successful here in the West at the time. But we know that Suikoden and Persona became huge and are some of the most well-beloved franchises in the JRPG genre. But why is that? How come these games became so big even though they didn't sell well at all? Well, I have a little theory about that. As I said before, people wanted more Final Fantasy VII, and since they were already done with that game, they started looking for similar games to quench their JRPG thirst. And I was one of those people. But since most of these amazing games would not come out until later, the only thing these people could do was to look backwards at games that were released before Final Fantasy VII. And that is the reason why JRPGs were not successful at first, but became successful with time. After I experienced a masterpiece that is Final Fantasy VII, I started looking for other games just like it. So I went to my local game store with only $20 I had left from my allowance, and asked for games that were similar to Final Fantasy VII. They showed me a copy of Suikoden, but it was a little bit too steep, so I could not afford it at the time. I started digging around in the bargain bin for games, and I was able to find something that looked decently interesting for only $19.99. And that game was Beyond the Beyond. Now, if you were around when the PlayStation started getting traction, this is a title that showed up a lot. But surprisingly, not a lot of people have played it. It's as classic as classic gets. Random encounters, turn-based combat, Dungeon crawling, yeah, you get the point. It was pretty sugoi for its time, and I remember having a great time with it. And now we're getting to the topic at hand. Why am I talking about this game? Well, the reason I picked this game up back in the day wasn't only because it was a JRPG. No, the main reason I had to get it was because of the company name that was written on the game case. Camelot. Known as Sonic Software Planning in the early 90s, they worked really close to Sega. And you might know them as the creators of the Shining series. Shining in the Darkness, Shining Force 1 and 2, Shining Force CD, and all of its spin-offs during the 90s were all developed by Sonic Software Planning. 
which were some of the coolest games I saw as a kid. Sonic Software Planning were not part of Sega, so they could develop for other companies if they so wanted to. And that is exactly what they did. They decided to change the company's name to Camelot Software Planning when they developed Beyond the Beyond for PlayStation, just to establish that they were not bind to Sega in any way, since keeping the name Sonic in their company name could confuse people. Now you might be wondering, how did you know that Sonic Software Planning and Camelot were the same company at the time? I mean, it was the early 90s, so how did you have access to that kind of information so easily? Well, let me tell you a story. I always kept up with Sega, since the Sega Mega Drive was a huge part of my childhood. Sadly, I never owned a Sega Saturn when it was released, because it was way too expensive at the time. $500 was way too much for a 9 year old set, which is why I got a PlayStation instead. But I always was looking forward to games from Sega, and one game that I always wanted to play was Shining Force 3 for the Sega Saturn. I had a magazine with an article of the game that also had screenshots, and the name of the developer was listed as Camelot, and the article also mentioned that the developers of Shining Force are bringing the third installment to the Sega Saturn. I would always read this article over and over, dreaming about the day I would be able to play my own copy of the game on my own Sega Saturn, which sadly never happened, but there was no way I would not remember the name Camelot after that. Anyway, back to Beyond the Beyond. I was very pleased with the game, and was looking forward what the company could be working on in the future. <sighs> if only I knew. This was at the time when Sega decided to purely focus on getting the Dreamcast out as soon as possible, since the Sega Saturn was not part of the company's future. And it was during this time that Camelot did something horrible. Camelot, who were working on Shining Force 3 while Sega made their decision, must have been unreasonably mad at Sega for this, and completely cut ties with Sega, never to work with them ever again. Sega didn't have a choice, and Camelot were just being selfish at this point. It could have ended there, but Camelot decided to take it one step further. They formed a partnership with Nintendo. This was the worst outcome for such a promising company, and they had to work with the most corrupt company in the industry. They were not tricked like a lot of other developers. They willingly went over to the dark side. And they started working on Mario sports titles, such as Mario Tennis and Mario Golf. It literally can't get worse than this. So for a couple of years they worked under Nintendo. Until one day, they started working on a genre they were very familiar with. And the game to come out of this was called Ogo no Tayo, or more commonly known as Golden Sun. It's a JRPG with random encounters, turn-based combat, and character portraits similar to Beyond the Beyond. This has everything needed to be a Super Sugoi JRPG. So despite this being a Nintendo game on a Nintendo system, could this actually be a good JRPG? Or did Camelot lose their sense of game design when they decided to join with Nintendo? Well, there's only one way to find out. So I got to borrow the game, together with a GameCube that plays Game Boy games, and a controller from my brother Dave. This is quite a hassle to get working. Do you have to do this every time you want to play a game? Wow! So here we go, Ogo no Tayo. Let's see what this game has to offer. First off, you can name the main character here before the game actually starts. I assume that you could get to name the rest of the characters when you meet them for the first time, just like Final Fantasy VII. But no, when you get the second party member, he's already named! Why? 
why would they let you name a party member at all if you can't even name all of them? There is no reason. And if any of you are thinking, what is he talking about? You can't name all the characters. Then don't bother commenting, because I already know. So by pressing the select button three times when naming the main character, you will hear a and the game will let you name the rest of the characters. But this is absolutely baka. They let you name all of them, sure, but you name them all before the game actually starts, spoiling all the characters. They could have done it like Final Fantasy VII, like I said before, and let you name them the moment you first met them. That would not spoil the story, and just get rid of the stupid select button trick to name them. Okay, the game has not started yet, and while this is a really baka decision, on Camelot's part, it has nothing to do with the gameplay or story. So, let's give this game a fair chance. So the game starts with this opening sequence where the main character's hometown is being attacked. And it starts with your mom waking you up. Wow, I wonder where you got that idea from, Camelot. Anyway, can you take a guess of what's attacking the village? A, a boulder. Um, okay. Not some kind of creature or evil villain, but a boulder? This is just extremely silly. If it was some evil man wrecking chaos, it would be so much more interesting. But no! Here we have our well-written and terrifying antagonist. A boulder. Wow. Anyway, so I walk through this fort. <laughs> what was that? What's with the jump scare? Is this a JRPG or a western horror game? So this is the combat. Very straightforward and simple. Nothing interesting here whatsoever. Anyway, you run around and talk to people for a while. Then the boulder comes down and kills some people. And then you get beaten up by some bad guys. And the screen fades to black. Well, that was a really boring intro segment that didn't tell me anything. And having a boulder as the first villain is not very sugoi. I would give Camelot a pass if this was some kind of meta joke about JRPGs. But knowing that they willingly joined Nintendo, I would say without a doubt that they thought this was a good idea. And it's obvious that during these few years at Nintendo have poisoned their minds with bad game design. Anyway, so now there's a three year skip. And the party members are a bit older. And after going through some boring discussions with some boring characters, it's time to hit the first dungeon. We have another party member now, and they added a new mechanic. Magic. And get ready for more bacaness. Here, every single character can use magic. Why did they think this was a good idea? It's obvious that the girl with the staff is a magic user, but she is not very good at melee attacks. And the other two party members can also use magic, and they're good at melee combat. This ruins the characters. It doesn't make sense story-wise why this is a thing. And since we're talking about magic, let me say that the character designs are so predictable and boring that you can figure out the character's elemental magic just by looking at them. This character here... Mm, yep. How about this character? I would have never guessed. How about her? Way too predict... Hold on here! Two fire users? W was this a mistake? Why put two fire users in the same party? There is no reason you need to do this, Camelot. Could this have been an oversight? Anyway, the fact that the party members have to have a design that indicates their elemental trait is just lazy and boring. If we follow this game's logic, then I would be able to... Anyway, so I kept exploring this dungeon... Oh! I can't get used to these jump scares! Like I said, I explore more of this dungeon, and after some battles and puzzles, I reach the end of it. There is a long segment here where bad guys shows up and kidnaps one of your party members, and they just talk and talk and talk, and then you have to run away, all the way back through the dungeon. And then there's even more talking about whether or not the main characters should head out to save the world or whatever. Spoilers! They do! So now we're out on the world map and the game introduces another game mechanic. It's some kind of creature that you equip, and you can attack with it. And it's stored up there on the screen, and it also gives you new attacks, 
but to get these attacks you have to go to the menu and activate it and you have to summon it in battle but only after you attack with it and by using the summon it gives you even more elemental power depending on which elemental the creature <sighs> oh <sighs> why do this many things with one mechanic it's just confusing and they just throw it on you like here you go have fun except it's not fun it's frustrating now, it's true that these creatures add attacks when you equip them. That is a pretty neat system, right? Well, the way this game does it is super awful. Instead of just adding attacks, they decided it was a good idea to get rid of some attacks the character has, then you get your new ones, which you have to do from the menu. But oops, if you used it as a summon, you have to run around on the world map for a bit before it activates again so you can equip it. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that this system is broken and busted and not very thought out at all. Now, let's keep playing. So we get another boring character to add to the party here, and it's a wind elementalist. Another predictable situation. After solving the village mystery, we continue on. We enter another dungeon, we get another creature and... Well, the game froze. And that is a good point to stop playing the game. And honestly, I'm glad that the game froze, because this is the most boring JRPG I've ever played. Golden Sun is filled to the brim with bad design choices. The combat is plain predictable and adds nothing to the genre. The graphics are colorful, but aside from the character portraits, the rest of the game is so ugly. It's like the characters are 3D renders from 1991, but instead are drawn over and are used as sprites instead. It's not pleasant to look at. The story is mind-numbingly boring, making even a game like Ocarina of Time seem more interesting. And this is a JRPG! How could they screw that up? But if there is one thing I liked about the game, it's the soundtrack. This is one of the few times where I can actually use the music from the game in the review without being embarrassed. And it makes sense, because the composer behind this soundtrack is Sakuraba Motoi. And you can tell by just listening to the music. But that doesn't make up for this game's straight up insult to all good JRPGs. And what makes me even more mad is the fact that Camelot used to make good games that respected JRPGs and Japanese culture. What happened? Why would you do this? I'm so mad that I could throw the game out the window. Oh, well, that made me feel way better. Anyway, I hope you swordlings enjoyed the video. Have a good night, evening, morning, or day. 
thank you for watching and arigato to all my patrons. Today Pretender Channel is a Patreon supported show. If you enjoyed this and want to support, for only $1 a month you can support the Dave Pretender channel. Check out my Patreon to the left. Watch more of my videos here and make sure to subscribe. Moshimosh!